Hi everyone, welcome to Psychic Creations. This show is what I term a listening program, as it is a fun narration rather than a lot of photos or a video. Please enjoy. Welcome to my 2021 Halloween program number two. This show is titled Facts About the Deceased, and I will be narrating on items of happenings after a loved one's demise. There is actually a difference between a casket and a coffin. A coffin is a six-sided box plus top and bottom. It's wider at the shoulders and tapers down towards the feet. Coffins are still used occasionally, but now they're more of a specialty item. A casket is the standard four-sided box most often used for modern burials. The average dimensions used in today's caskets are length 84 inches, width 28 inches, height 23 inches. At one time, caskets had no exact measurements. They were just built. If a particular body didn't fit, the bones were broken so they could just be stuffed in. It was a common practice if a body was too long for the ankles to be broken and then the feet placed back upon the legs. Here is an interesting piece of trivia. It's called the art of lying. Lying in repose typically refers to when the casket of someone of a high stature, such as a government official, can be publicly viewed in a building other than the U.S. Capitol, so the public can pay their respects. Lying in state is a rare honor reserved for select elected officials and military officers. They are granted the honor of having their casket placed in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol for public viewing. Members of the armed forces guard the caskets, each representing one of the branches, and periodically rotate. Lying in honor is reserved only for private citizens who are given the honor of having their casket placed in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda for public viewing. A lying in honor was offered to Rosa Parks and Billy Graham. At one time, people feared being buried alive so much, special safety coffins were invented. History shows that tapphobia, or the fear of being buried alive, has some degree of merit. As early as the 14th century, there are accounts of specific people being buried alive. Following are a few accounts of those who were buried alive. While lightly apocryphal, when his tomb was opened, the body of philosopher John Duns Scotus of the High Middle Ages was reportedly found outside of his coffin his hands torn up in a way that suggested he had tried to free himself. In 17th century England, it is documented that a woman by the name of Alice Blunden was buried alive. As the story goes, she was so knocked out after having imbibed a large quantity of poppy tea that a doctor holding a mirror to her nose and mouth pronounced her dead. Now, tea made from dried, unwashed seed pods would have contained morphine and codeine, which are sedatives. Her family quickly made arrangements for her burial, but two days after she was laid in the ground, children playing near her grave heard noises. Their schoolmaster went to check the grave site for himself. He found that Blunden was still alive, but it took another day to exhume her. She was so close to death that she was returned to her grave where a guard stood by before deserting his post. The next morning, she was found dead, but only after struggling to free herself once more. Modern medicine hasn't totally thwarted 
the tales of being buried alive. In 2011, a woman in Russia collapsed at her home following a heart attack. A few days later, as she was laying in her casket at her own funeral, she woke up. She saw the mourners around her crying and praying for her, and quickly, noticing what was happening, began yelling and was rushed back to the hospital. She lived for an additional 12 minutes in intensive care prior to dying once more, this time for good. The cause of her death? Heart failure. And in 2014, Walter Williams of Mississippi was pronounced dead on February 26th. His body was put into a body bag and he was taken to a funeral home. When his body was taken to the embalming room, his legs began to move. Then the coroner noticed him slightly breathing. Williams was alive. It was, as it turned out, a short-lived reprieve. Just over two weeks later, he passed away for real. Here is a piece of trivia that is titled, The Long and Short of It. One of the longest funerals in the world was with the 1852 death of the Duke of Wellington, the vanquisher of Napoleon and the popularizer of tall, wet weather boots, stated in his will that his body be left at the disposal of his sovereign. So, upon his death, Queen Victoria declared that his funeral should be an unprecedented event befitting both the greatness of the Duke's formidable military career and of the British Empire. Wellington actually is one of only a handful of non-royals to have been accorded a state funeral. An estimated 1.5 million people converged on the procession route witnessing his carriage, or car as it was known, created especially for this occasion, which was cast from over 10 tons of bronze cannon captured at Waterloo. Six foundries employed over 100 men for 18 days to make it. The resulting creation measured 27 feet in length, 10 feet wide, and 17 feet high. A canopy of silk and silver hung from four hall breads above the main structure. It required 12 horses to pull the 12-ton six-wheeled funeral car, and the service was delayed for over an hour owing to the slow progress of the vast cortege through the streets of London. The shortest funeral in the world occurred when Mary Desmond died in early 1920. Her family home stood up against the wall of the cemetery. Her funeral was on a bitter, cold day in November, and the roads around her home were frozen over. The horse-drawn hearse couldn't make it. Mary's coffin was carried sideways in through the front door, and when the body was placed in it, her family removed it to the back window that looked into the graveyard. The coffin was passed out through the window, and Mary was buried only a few feet away. The approximate time of her funeral? Nine minutes. Now, to add to this, the largest funeral crowd ever recorded was for a man little known outside of his home country. Upon his death in 1969, Mr. Onaduray was the chief minister of the Tamil Nadu, a state in southern India. An actor, writer, and proponent of the Tamil culture, he fought against the imposition of Hindi as the official language of India. He was universally beloved in his home state. When he died while still in office, it is estimated that 15 million people came out into the streets to view his body. Now here is something I have never heard of. Coffin torpedoes. Grave robbing got to be hazardous in the 1880s. Keeping the dead buried was a matter of grave concern in the 19th century America. 
As medical schools proliferated after the Civil War, the field grew increasingly tied to the study of anatomy and the practice of dissection. Professors needed bodies for the young doctors to carve into, and the pool of legally available corpses, executed criminals and body donors, was minuscule. Enter freelance body snatchers, dispatched to do the digging. By the late 1800s, the illicit body trade was flourishing. Capitalizing on the public's funeral anxiety, inventors got to work. Their solution? Explosives. Philip Clover of Columbus, Ohio, patented an early coffin torpedo in 1878. Clover's instrument functioned like a small shotgun secured inside the coffin lid in order to, quote, prevent the unauthorized resurrection of dead bodies. Quote, if someone tried to remove a buried body, the torpedo would fire out a lethal blast of lead balls when the lid was pried open. There was a time that there was a very strict burial timetable because embalming wasn't a common practice until the beginning of the 1900s. Burial timetables had to be instituted, expressly so, in warm weather. Now, number one, the deceased were usually buried at the end of, if not before, a 24-hour period. So they were buried usually the first day if they had no family available. Number two, when the coroner's inquest was lengthy, burial was usually conducted on the second day. Number three, if the deceased had family, the undertaker tended the body on the second day with the funeral being performed with burial, which was common on the third day. Bronze Age Britons remembered their deceased by making keepsakes from parts of the dead relatives. Bits of their bodies were turned into instruments and ornaments as mementos or perhaps for home display. This practice is indicative of a broader mindset where the line between the living and the dead was more blurred than it is today. There wasn't a mindset that human remains go in the ground and you forget about them. They were always present among the living. While this practice might seem macabre by modern standards, retaining bits of friends and relatives lives on in the tradition of keeping an urn of a loved one's ashes on the mantelpiece. Here is a piece of trivia titled, The Whole Nine Yards. A cemetery is where the remains of dead people are buried or otherwise interred. A graveyard is primarily a burial ground within a churchyard. A churchyard is a patch of land adjoining or surrounding a church. A crypt is an underground room or vault beneath a church used as a chapel or burial place. A mausoleum is a building, especially a large and stately one, housing a tomb or tombs. A tomb is a large vault, typically an underground one, for burying the dead. And grave fields are distinguished from necropolis by the former's lack of above-ground structures buildings, or grave markers. Here are a couple of experiences that a mortician has shared. Number one, I used to work in tissue recovery. My least favorite part was preparing the donor for the recovery process, as it included shaving the arms and legs. Once we had a donor who was very freshly deceased, and I held his hand to shave his arm. 
and his fingers curled around my hand as rigor mortis set in. Number two. There had been a big accident in our small town. It was a pile-up, and there were several bodies at once in the morgue. Also, some of them came in pieces, and we had to put them back together like a puzzle. I was working, and I actually thought I saw a forearm with a tattoo move a little bit. I thought to myself, that it was just my imagination, so I kept working. Next thing I know, I saw it move again. Oh, I decided, oh, heck with it, and kept looking at it, but nothing happened. I actually felt kind of silly. I saw it move for the third time, and this really did move right there in front of my eyes. But how can this be possible? One of my co-workers came through the door and didn't say anything. But sometime later, he approached me and told me, Hey man, you got it wrong. I got what wrong, I asked. That piece, that arm, it doesn't belong to that body. What? I said. See, this forearm goes over there. It belongs to that body. Ugh. I had actually made the mistake of misplacing the parts, I guess. And maybe that arm was trying to tell me something. People feared being buried alive so much, they invented special safety coffins. Now, the creepiest categories of invention, coffin alarms, were a series of inventions in the 19th century which would aid someone who was buried alive, to escape, breathe, and signal for help. Patent number 81,437 was granted to Franz Vister on August 25, 1868, for an, quote, improved burial case. The tomb is equipped with a number of features, including an airlet, a ladder, and a bell, so that the person upon waking could save himself. If too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Patent number 268,693 was granted on December 5, 1882 to John Critchbaum for a device indicating life in buried persons. The device has both the means for indicating movement as well as a way of getting fresh air into the coffin. The disclosure states that, quote, it will be seen that if a person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed, quote, a marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T, and air passively comes down into the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure that the person is dead, the device can be removed. Patent number 329,495 was granted on November 3, 1885, to Charles Seiler and Frederick Borntrager for a burial casket. The invention provides for improvements in the important components of previous quote-unquote buried alive inventions. In this instant, motion of the body triggers a clockwork driven fan which will force fresh breathable air into the coffin instead of a passive air pipe. The device also includes a battery-powered alarm. According to the patent, when the hand is moved, the exposed part of the wire will come in contact with the body, completing the circuit between the alarm and the ground to the body in the coffin. The alarm will sound. There is also a spring-loaded rod, which will raise up carrying feathers 
or other signals. Additionally, a tube is positioned over the face of the buried body so that a lamp may be introduced down the tube and a person looking down through the tube can see the face of the body in the coffin. As medicine has advanced, there have, of course, been technological advances in determining if someone is dead or alive. The doctors can hook up a body to machines that monitor heartbeat, brain waves, and respiration. But even though the fad of coffin alarms has long passed, there are some interesting 21st century innovations with connecting with the dead. Patent number 7,765,656, granted August 3 of 2010 to Jeff Dannenberg for an apparatus and method for generating post-burial audio communications in a burial casket. In this instant, the casket has an audio message system containing audio and music files that are automatically played in accordance with the program schedule, thereby allowing the living to communicate with the deceased. The system also allows for wireless updating of the recorded files, giving, quote, surviving family members the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Patent number 9,226,059, granted on December 29, 2015, to John Knight for, quote, your music for eternity systems. This system comprises a solar-powered digital music player, which allows both the living as well as the dearly departed to be comforted by music or a recorded message. There is a speaker in the casket and a headset jack on the headstone. Patent number 5,353,609, granted on October 11, 1994, to Ruby Hall for a casket jewelry guard apparatus. Tomb robbing was recognized as a problem as early as the early dynastic period circa 3150 to 2613 BC, and the living have taken measurements to protect the dead and their valuables back to the time of Egyptian pharaohs. Many of these tombs were equipped with deterrence and safety measures. This invention, patented in 1994, however, is next level when it comes to protecting the deceased's valuables the apparatus attaches the jewelry worn by the deceased to an alarm system while also securing it to the casket. So even after death do us part, spouses can wear their wedding rings for eternity. Joseph Anthony Conboy was born in Ireland in 1830. Before coming to Nevada and to Virginia City, he called many United States towns his home. His profession was as an undertaker. On October 29, 1901, Comboy received a patent for his hand case. This invention relates to a device for facilitating laying out or, in other words, properly disposing the hands of dead people. When a dead body is to be prepared for burial, it is customary to straighten out the arms and hands so that they will have a natural looking position as possible under the circumstances. And his invention has for its object to provide a means for effecting this result and also for enabling bleaching fluid to be poured onto white cotton inside of the hand case, which is like a metal mitten having a top and a bottom with hinges, which then saturates the hands so as to whiten them. While this is the principal use of the invention, 
It is also applicable to the treatment of diseases of the hands of the living persons. So far, Joseph Conboy's patent, number 685574, has been updated 111 times. As if the death of a loved one wasn't traumatic enough, the Dani people of West Papua, New Guinea, also had to cut off their own fingers. One finger per each death. The seemingly severe and incomprehensible ritual applied to any woman related to the deceased, as well as any children. The practice was done to both gratify and drive away the spirits, while also providing a way to use physical pain as an expression of sorrow and suffering. To perform the amputation, fingers were tightly tied with string and then cut off with an axe. The leftover piece was then dried and burned to ashes or stored in a special place. This ritual is now banned in New Guinea, but the effects of the practice can still be seen in some of the older members of the community. Did you know that your body will gradually chill after death? It takes a while, but your body will get cold as you will lose 1.5 degrees per hour for 20 to 30 hours until you reach an ambient temperature. Some parts of your body will live longer. While some body parts expire quickly, Others may live on for hours after you die, such as your eyes, heart, bones, and skins can still be viable for transplant up to 15 hours after you pass away. On March 11, 2010, the investigative team that I am a part of was given a private tour of the Virginia City Courthouse it was explained that a spirit turns on the automatic towel dispenser, which is not a motion detector equipped device, when a woman enters into the women's restroom. The towel dispenser did indeed turn on by itself when I entered into the room. Walking around inside of the courtroom, numerous photos were taken. Looking at my pictures later, it was astonishing to discover a spirit in one picture. It is of a female wearing a dress and bonnet, and it is clearly shown she is carrying something in her right hand. Perhaps the murder weapon? This concludes my Halloween number two show titled Death's Happenings. Thank you for your interest and enjoying both of my Psychic Creations Halloween 2021 programs. <laughs>